Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Please keep your video and audio off and select speaker view so you can fully enjoy the performances. I hear a doggy who wants to perform a monologue. <laughs> Please um, uh, keep your video and audio off. Uh, I'm um, Saviana. I'm a Romanian writer and activist with Balkan and Roma roots who founded immigrant slash international artists and scholars in New York 10 years ago as a New York University professor and New York artist. First of all, I would like to acknowledge that the land I currently reside on, Ithaca, New York, is the traditional territory shared between the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Cayuga Nation. I acknowledge the painful history of genocide and forced removal from the territory, and I honor and respect the many diverse indigenous peoples still connected to this land. I also recognize that today we convene in this vibrant cyberspace, while many people around the world don't even have access to internet. Let's send our good vibes and positive thoughts to global citizens across borders, cultures, and languages, to fellow playwrights and artists everywhere. YASNI is an alliance of people in the arts and academia who are international first-generation immigrants or supporters of immigrant artists and scholars in the US. It goes without saying, but I'm going to say it anyway, we believe that immigrant voices have been vital for the fabric of this great nation. And that continues to be true in the age of global citizenship in an interconnected world. Lady Liberty is still watching us from a virtual background, whispering in many accents, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. We immigrants are groundbreakers trailblazers, pioneers. However, let's acknowledge that not all the immigrants in the US have the right to vote. Those who are privileged to be US citizens, please go and vote, vote, vote. I'm very grateful to our 10-year partnership with the Nurican Poets Cafe in East Village. Our annual event honoring Immigrant Heritage Month has been traditionally called New York with an accent. This year, we embarked in a new adventure, Liberty's Daughters, an evening of immigrant women's monologues written and performed by powerful artists across generations and ethnicities. At the end of the evening, there will be a short talk back with the artists. Please feel free to post questions in the chat. We'll take your questions at the end. On behalf of the Nurican Poets Cafe, we'd like to thank the National Endowment for the Arts, the New York State Council on the Arts, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, the Amazon Literary Partnership, the Academy of American Poets, and the New York Community Trust's COVID-19 Response Fund for helping us to provide free online programming. Please help support the Nurican Poets Cafe's efforts with a tax deductible donation by visiting www.nurican.org slash contribute or via cash app to Nurican Poets Cafe. We hope that Liberty's Daughters will make you think, laugh, cry, take actions of support and connect across borders, real and imagined. But most of all, we hope you'll enjoy this evening filled with talent, immigrant power and inspiration. Please keep your video and audio off so you can fully enjoy the performances. Each artist will introduce themselves and their piece. Thank you so much for joining us on this exciting journey. Enjoy. Rosa, you are the first. Hi everybody, my name is Rosa Arredondo and I am um, first generation American. Um, I am speaking to you right now from the land of the Apache, 
but my home is on the land of the Lenape and the Matanikuk tribes. Um, my piece is a monologue from a one woman show that I wrote that is a series of monologues called Journeys. And it is about the actual physical journey, the emotional journey, the mental journey of the immigrant experience, um, different immigrants coming to the US and basically covering the why and how they felt when they got here. Um, and the monologues are connected, but they stand alone on their own. So this is my monologue titled God's Child. I did not ask to come here. It was not my idea to come to this place so cold, so gray, buildings so tall, they poke holes in the sky. You can't even feel the sun on your skin. It's crazy. I did not want to come here to this place where mothers lose their sons, where they watch as they lie bleeding in the streets, slowly dying, where daughters grow up too soon, where they feel trapped. My children, their environment, bad relationships. No. No, I did not want to come here. The wrought iron cages stick out of every window like thorny branches on an ugly tree. I step out onto mine. I look down and I wonder, will the fall kill me? Will it lift my soul? out of this place and into the comfort of your arms, Lord. I don't think the Lord hears me here. I don't think he speaks my language here. But I came. because I love him, because it was my duty as a wife to follow my husband to the end of the earth. So I left everything I knew, the warmth of my mother's voice, my brothers, my friends, my entire existence and with no ex expectations, I came to this place. And now he tells me there's another? And now he tells me there's another. I changed everything about my life. I came to this place where I know no one, where I have never felt more alone, where there is no silence. People yell and sirens scream all night. I did not ask for this, but here it is and it's mine. I write letters. I write letters back home. I say that it's wonderful. I say that I'm happy, that I have friends, that it's peaceful, beautiful. I lie, I lie. I go back to my Rhode Island cage. I look up and I cry to the heavens. I did not ask for this, Lord, this darkness, this, this overwhelming despair. I see the blinds in the sky and I go, oh, oh. I did not ask for this, God, this I did not ask for.
but God does not hear me. Not here. Hi, my name is Alice Eve Cohen, and I'm so honored to be part of Liberty's Daughters. I acknowledge that I am speaking from my apartment in Manhattan's Upper West Side, which sits on unceded indigenous land, specifically the homeland of the Lenape peoples. I'm going to read a monologue from my multi-character solo play, Thin Walls. Set in the 1980s, the play is about 12 diverse neighbors in a low-income residential hotel in Manhattan's Upper West Side. The play is based on real people, real events, and a real building. The play is set in the Belclair Hotel, where I'm sitting, where I have lived for 40 years. Today, the Belclair is one of three Upper West Side hotels that have been transformed into temporary homeless shelters during the pandemic in order to reduce the spread of COVID-19. And these hotels are the center of a current New York City controversy. There is tremendous NIMBY hostility from rich Upper West Side residents directed towards our new neighbors in the three homeless shelters and they're fighting very hard to get them out. I have been fighting on behalf of our new neighbors and I'm part of a social justice group called Upper West Side Open Hearts. For more information visit www.uwsopenhearts.org and wherever you live please join the fight for housing justice. Um, this piece uh, is one that I wrote years ago, and um, I'm going to read Hava's monologue from Thin Walls. Hava is a 23-year-old Israeli immigrant. She's a cellist and a grad student at Juilliard. She's sharing an apartment in the rundown Belclair Hotel with a 37-year-old single mom and her little girl. Both women are broke. Hava is talking to her roommate in the kitchen in the middle of the night. You are so nice to feed me sometimes late at night when I come home and put on my stupid puppy dog nightgown from Israel and my fluffy slippers. Oh, about the rent check. Please wait maybe two days before you deposit it so that it will not bounce again. Could I talk to you about something? It is about my boyfriend. I think he is not trustable. Well, last week it was my birthday. Thank you, but it was not a happy birthday. My boyfriend did not buy for me a present. So I said, it is my birthday, buy for me a present. So he did, but it didn't mean anything because I had to tell him to buy it for me. My boyfriend is very plump and soft. It feels so good. And so a few nights ago, we were lying in bed and I had my arm around him. And actually his breasts are bigger than mine. And I, I was fondling his soft breasts and he jumped out of the bed and he said, stop it. Don't ever touch me there again. You're humiliating me. And I said, oh, but you feel so good. I love to touch you there. And he said, don't, it is terrible. And I said, but it's just funny. I am always complaining my breasts are too small and you think your breasts are too big, so it's funny. But he never laughs from my jokes. My friends laugh from my jokes. I think I am so funny, I am so cute, I am so nice. But I think he does not love me. And then two nights ago, we were at his house watching a movie together. It was nice watching a movie. It was pornographic movie, but it was nice. And after the pornographic movie was over, he says, I don't want you to know where I keep the pornographic movie. So he goes into his room. In his room, he has only one bed and one box, and I hear the box open and close, so I know the pornographic movie is in the box. And he said, never open the box. So the next morning we woke up and he had to go early to school and if you say to somebody, don't open the box, she has to open the box. So open the box and inside there are 50 
50 pornographic movies. And I think, why does he need 50 pornographic movies? And most of them are of two women. And I think, am I not enough? And I think maybe I am for him just sex machine. You are the only person in all of New York I can talk to about this. Maybe because my family is all in Israel, you are for me like a big sister. You are my big sister. I can respect and trust you. In all of New York City, you are my only real friend. I didn't tell you this, but uh, I had last month opportunity to share a very nice apartment one block from school. And I thought about it, but decided I would rather stay here with you because even though you are very busy and I am very busy and you are often asleep when I come home, it is important for me to know that you are only on the other side of a thin wall. Hi, I'm Mariana Carreño, um, and um, I'm zooming in from the Bronx, Lenape territory, and I'm here to talk about Beatles. And oh my God, just realized Cory Thomas has a brilliant play about bugs. So um, this is for you, sis. I have been thinking a lot about Beatles. Not the Beatles like the Beatles, like Obla Di Obla Da, but um, Beatles, like the bugs. And um, did you know that there is a beetle that can survive being crushed under 3,500 pounds without a single broken body part? It's called Floides Diabolicus, or Diabolical Ironclad Beetle. It's no bigger than an inch, but its strength, it's ridiculous. Its shell can withstand 39,000 times its body weight. That would jellify any human. Its body is basically an indestructible armor with airbags between the shell and its organs. So it just doesn't die or, you know, it dies of old age at the rate ripe age of eight. And I think it'd be kind of neat to have that protection now. I mean, with the pandemic and the election and the barrage of insane news every single day, the violence, the injustices, it'd be nice to have an armor that strong. When I was a kid, I used to have a mantra. If I don't move, nobody will see me. If I don't breathe, no one will know I'm here. If I close my eyes, I'm invisible. That was my armor. And sometimes it worked and I felt safe. Sometimes it didn't and I wasn't. Then I learned better coping mechanisms like pretending to be someone I wasn't. Then I went to therapy and then I moved to New York. But sometimes I still wanna be so still that I disappear. As if camouflaging or playing dead would make all the troubles go away. And, and beetles play dead too, you know? A coping mechanism, and they survived for 270 million years. So that might not be a bad strategy, but when needed, beetles have also learned to fight back. They've adapted beautiful, beautifully to all kinds of environments. Some have learned to fly some to carry and recycle shit around, some to dive underwater. 
Some actually have developed hearing organs. Most are attentive parents. They are family oriented, living in communities made of multiple generations. Beatles are cool. And I'm not the only one who thinks that. There are venerator scarabs in Egypt and fighting rhinoceros beetles in Japan. Colorful beetles are kept as decoration and encrusted with beads. Beetles that are eaten and used as pest control. Some are also pests and some are kept as pets. With over 2 million species, beetles are one of the largest order of insects. They're tiny cute ones like ladybugs and really freaky ones like the one that can attract tadpoles, tricking them into thinking they are prey and then jumping on the tadpoles backs and sucking the life out of them. And I can't help thinking that we're not that different. I mean, we migrate we adapt, we camouflage, we code switch, we carry shit around and create armors around ourselves, walls, barriers. We lock our doors, shut our windows. We move from one environment to another, from one language to another. We survive. And we also live in communities and care for our families. Most of us, beetles and humans, are vulnerable social creatures. No armor is thick enough. Chances are, sooner or later, we'll be crushed by friend or foe. We can, as beetles do, adapt to our environment. But unlike beetles, we also have the power to change it. We might not be able to withstand 39,000 times our body weight, but we can be fierce too, if we choose to. If we choose not to close our eyes and pretend we don't exist. If we don't still, if we don't stay still and silent. If we don't hold our breath in order to disappear if we don't pretend we're not here, if we act even when we are not safe, if we don't become invisible, please vote. Thank you. Hello. Tiasha for me here. So honored to be on this event tonight. Thank you for the invitation. Um, zooming in from Manhattan. Um, this is a brand new monologue. It's a rant, I suppose, that enca encapsulates, uh, encapsulates how I feel um, in this moment. And I'm already nervous just announcing it. Um, it was inspired by Michael Moore's The Planet of the Human, so all about sustainability. And then that was all taken out. Then it was inspired by a Facebook memory, um, a picture that popped up, and you will hear all about it. And um, there's a side note, I wanna say, I'm not from Bulgaria, I'm from Slovenia, even though in the piece, I'm talking about Bulgaria. Okay, it's a rant, uh, fasten your seat belts, and I'm going to read this. <clears throat> America, you were the first to know how self-promoting and propaganda works. How, if you say it loudly and frequently enough, the whole world would believe it and then everybody wanted to move here and saw that you were a fake and then we all became fakes because we wanted to play and be equal in the game that you invented. Boasting and uttering lies never started with Trump. It was embedded in the American psyche since the beginning. Americans made Trump Trump. Selling high force of capitalism make America undertake these marketing strategies built on lies and capitalism. Consumer behavior, addiction, values of comparison and competition, where capital and profit are the king, twin kings. Romulus and Remus, discarded, raised by a she-wolf, came back and seized the capital. 
Ah, we all thought it was just a fairy tale, but it was a cautionary tale of the shadow of human nature, a successfully camouflaged, undeciphered metaphor that came true. The discard discarded brother came to bite us in our ass. This is just a long rant of how an innocent girl followed her dreams, worked hard, and came to the States. Looking at a picture where a 23-year-old did a photo shoot and a makeup session dressed as a Barbie. My face is clear, my eyes are open, my gaze is loving and not cold and piercing and calculated as it is now. As a 23-year-old, I don't have a little bump between my eyebrows. It's not an age crease, it's an overthinking crease. My ex-boss used to say I have it because I'm thoughtful. Yeah, I'm thoughtful. I'm trying to understand your signals of behavior, of unclear communication, and always cheery pretending everything's okay until it's not. I'm thoughtful. I'm thinking about your posing and phrases and in genuine behavior. I'm trying to suppress my intuition. Uh, I'm trying to suppress my instincts, trying to suppress my temper, trying to suppress my intuition to fit and be able to decipher what the fuck you're actually telling me to do, to stay or go how to maneuver to have friends, be successful and not be a liar and a cheater, which is exactly what the system is teaching me I need to be if I want to live, not thrive, live. I feel like Gaita's birther who had come to the country, a hungry laughing devil who said that if I want to be here, I have to give up my soul. And as a 23 year old, I had no idea what a soul was and that I had one. So I said, oh sure, go for it. Not knowing that it will cost me that, which I didn't know I had to lose. In Bulgaria, you put on huge posters and you say, American dream in bold, American lifestyle in italics, come live, work and study in red. America gives green cards for free. Get an education. You'll have an amazing job and you will prosper. It's good to have a footing near Russia, pretending a European outpost of IBM is of interest and not a military base. Capitalism equals slavery. You know that, right? This is a planet of slavery. The system in place makes us enslave each other and still people's precious time to work in inhumane conditions, ways, and time frames to bring us on our knees where we need. We desperately need this job to pay for treatment of an illness it has given us, for our family, and until we have nothing else to give because you have sucked us dry. And when we finally realize it, there's no way to beat the system because we're too broken to stand up and set ourselves and our people free. In order to save the world, I'm going to propose Eastern European ways of recycling. Central European doesn't mean anything to you, right? Except that you think it's like Eastern European. So anyways, let's get to work. First, when people want to give you their old clothes and you like them, the clothes, always say yes. Let them fall into the consumer wormholes in Overshop. Even if everybody takes this piece of advice, there will only be so many people who will be able to get a relief from this absolute society's addiction to shop, to fill the void, and to have something to do. It's fun, relaxing, looking young and happy, better. Yeah, go shopping. And I just said go shopping, like go fuck yourself. And I don't think there is so much of a difference, except the actual sex making love means freedom. It's fantastic and transcending. But when I say go fuck yourself, that's not what I mean. So always accept clothes. Second, oftentimes go street shopping. That means go and look among other people's trash and fish out some nice looking furniture and things you might need in your apartment. I know that most Americans are so isolated and paranoid and that just seems disgusting, but trust me, this is good for the planet and it is good for your wallet. And I know that it sounds counterintuitive, but that's just because you've been brainwashed with the commercials, advertising, marketing, and propaganda telling you you live better and you are better if you shop more. Kill the lie. Claim sovereignty. Third, when you go to a salad bar, this is how you organize yourself. First, greens. They're the lightest. Then blueberries. They're the second lightest. Then you can start stacking medium heavy and then heavy shit on top. While you wait in the line to check out, reach into your box, just no plastic and styrofoam, please, and start eating top to bottom heavy objects first. By the time you make it to the register, you'll eat approximately 30% of what's in your box, but luckily for you, that's the heaviest part. Savings, 50%. Kill the lie of shopping. Do you think that's wrong? Do you? Think again. Think who the system favors. The rich, the successful, the big shops, big employers, big daddies, yeah. Do they really need those extra five bucks off of you every single time you walk into that store? No, they don't. But sheer morality makes you think that's correct. Think again. 
kill lies, question morality. Morality is never easy. It often seems like there's only two sides, but there's a lot of footnotes, don't you know? Polarity, polarity is what's killing this country. In America, it's only your fault that it is so, and you know why. Because all along, you have not been investing in your thinkers. You have not been investing in your writers, your philosophers, and your artists. That's the crew that brings up the nuances and footnotes to the existence. They bring color to your black and white. Polarity is made for governments who enjoy the war because war means business. And the colors are made for living. Why do you think the peace flag is a rainbow? Why do you think LGBTQ flag is a rainbow? Colors, colors, many, many colors. Let's bring more colors. That's why we're here for, right? Thanks for listening. I wish you love and I still have hope. And let me tell you the salad bar trick, this can only be done in America. Oh, sweet, sweet home America. Just don't do it in a small mind, pa shop. Hello, uh, my name is Jessica, Jessica Litwak, and I am uh, gratefully sitting on uh, Lenape land here in, uh, in Manhattan. But the piece that I'm going to read takes place on Ohlone land in San Francisco. Um, it's a piece, I'm going to read a little scene from uh, my play 50,000 Mice that was commissioned to commemorate the um, centennial of the 19th Amendment. The title is because uh, the, the character of Selena Solomons, who it's about, is a real person who was a Sephardic Jew in San Francisco who helped get the vote for women in 1911 for the state of California. And the play, which you can see uh, tomorrow night, we're having a watch party on YouTube, has a lot of characters in it, uh, including uh, uh, Native American women and African American women who talk about issues of voting rights. Um, and voter suppression. So the title comes from when the women in California went to the state legislature and pleading for suffrage. And they said, look, we're 40 women, but we represent 50,000 Californian women. And the chairman said to them, you're no more than 50,000 mice. So um, I'm gonna read a little bit um, from, from here at a moment when the vote is lost. So what happened in California that night, October 10th, 1911, was that the city of San Francisco lost the vote uh, but for women, but then uh, very, very late at night, towards the next morning, the votes were counted from rural and Southern parts of the state and they found that they'd won, but this is not that moment yet. Baby, sit down. Is it bad news? Why do people always tell you to sit down for bad news? So you won't fall. I won't fall. Baby, we're losing. We're not losing. Theo said the streets were thronged with women. Yeah, well, the numbers are in. The San Francisco liquor lobby was too strong for us. They shut us out in precinct after precinct. Men voted to save their whiskey and secure the silence of obedient wives. I'm sorry, my love. We've lost the city. And the state? We believe, we presume the state. How can an unjust system be, be, be so acceptable to so many? How can people not see women suffering? How can this great country be so blind? Because we're being punished, Selena. Retribution for this beloved America that was built on the genocide of one race and the enslavement of another. Well, if I've lost this, then then all is lost. Not all. All. There's still us. What is us compared with this? You know, Celine, if you put everything into your work, your entire heart into social outcomes and political change, you're going to wake up one day and be completely alone. Just go away, Bess. You know, uh, if you can't find willingness to show your true self, to be with me fully, then I will go. I cannot stay. All right? 
Not anymore. Goodbye, Selena. Perhaps. Miss Selena? Where did Miss Bess go? Miss Selena, what happened? I fell asleep. How could I fall asleep on election day? You got hit in the head, Tuli. You passed out. I need to get back out there. No, lay back down, Tuli. It's too late. We lost. No, 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 we can't lose. We can't. There's so many of us out there fighting and fighting. I'll, I'll go back out. I'll count the votes. No, no, no one can change the fate of suffrage in this damn city. Big greed will win out over big heart. And now I fear I've lost Bess. You know, you should have some soup. I bet you haven't eaten all day, Miss Selina. No, oh, soup is ridiculous. My whole life is ridiculous. My ridiculous dreams. My ridiculous country. Listen. Shh. Listen to the ancestors. Listen to the wind. You have no air in you, daughter. You are water. You are earth. You are fire. Quiet your breath completely. Listen to the air. From the side of the room, I hear Joaquina watching me. She's listening for my listening. Is she breathing this voice into me? Quiet, shh, all thought. What do you hear? I hear my mother. No, further back, beyond known time. Keep going. What do you smell? Dust. Daughter, who are you? I am your mother's 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 mama. From a golden age in history, way, way, way down the line of women. Andalusia, Cordoba. You will never have a daughter of your own. So, since you cannot lean forward in blood, lean back here, breathe my breath. You have failed. Your cause is crushed. You are stewing in self-pity. Let it go. You were damned by the man who called you mouse. Are you a mouse? <laughs> you huddle on the floor of yourself. Get up, daughter. We fought off the soldiers of the Inquisition with our bare hands. We wiped the blood off the children and hid them under the floorboards until the hoof beats passed. We crawled on hands and knees, hungry to the edges of our hideaways to wrestle fruit and acorns like squirrels. Our homeland, now a death sentence. Some of us surrendered our bodies. Some our religion. Others jumped head first off cliffs. Some killed their own children rather than have them relinquish Judaism. Some killed themselves and their elders with kitchen knives. Some tried to kill the oppressors. Some screamed, some went silent. Some made it to Portugal or to Palestine and centuries later to the new world. The question though is always the same. What do you do in the face of sudden darkness? Do you lay down? Or do you stand up? I was decapitated by Queen Isabella's men. And as the sword came down, they shouted, die, Jew. But I wasn't scared. I knew deep in my skin that I would never stop fighting, that I would fight the enemies of justice hard so my children could live. You are more like me than anyone in our lineage. That's why I'm here. But you don't know your strength. You were taught fear and passivity by the culture around you. Wipe your tears, get up daughter, rally. There will be another vote. There will be another day. Find your allies, pull on your boots, saddle your horses. Think of the women who came before you. Think 
of the ones who will come after. Rise, 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 rise. And we rise for all the women who came before, for Alice Paul and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony, Ida B. Wells, Sojourner Truth, Harriet Tubman, and the men say, turn those women down hard. Sorry for your lost ears, but we commend your spunk. Let's give a vote of thanks to the ladies. And we say, in the name of all the women of this country, we wish to decline your vote of thanks. We want the vote itself. And the men say, what can women do with the vote? And we say, Nanny Helen Burroughs, a suffrage leader and former slave, when asked what women could do with the ballot, responded, what can she do without it? And so we rise for the women who will come after us, for all the women who will vote. Hello, my name is Bernice Miller. Uh, my pronouns, she, her, they, as in those whose shoulders I stand on. I am originally from the island of Jamaica, but I'm coming to you now from Brooklyn, New York, the land that was taken from the Canarsie and Muncie people of the Lenape Nation. Uh, the monologue I'm presenting is from a play I wrote um, some years ago, almost immediately after my mother died. It's called Under the Monkey Tamarind Tree. It's a two character play for one performer. And it's an exploration of issues that I had not then had the courage to raise with my mother while she was still alive. Now, full disclosure, this is not a monologue for children as it is uh, sexually explicit and it might be triggering to some adults. So if children are nearby, you might invite them to leave the space as I begin. And here we go from Under the Monkey Tamarind Tree. Ama is forever telling me that I can come and tell her anything. That I should think of her as my mother but also as my best friend, that I shouldn't keep secrets from her, that I should share my life with her. Well, should I be a friend and tell you just how frail your world is, or is that being too impertinent, Ma? Should I blame you for forcing me to study so hard from such a young age that it's taken me forever to realize that I wasn't learning anything about life, that is. I mean, you keep shoveling me that shit about my body being my temple, and you continue to believe in book learning as the panacea to all problems. Well, God damn it, Ma. It was no great piece of literature that prepared me for life. I was educated right here at home with no help from Br'er Wordsworth or Massa Shakespeare. <sighs> you remember? It was my birthday party. I just turned nine. And Uncle Trevor, who isn't my real uncle anyway, said that he would tell me a bedtime story. I remember all the aunts and cousins laughing because even though I was old enough to know better, I was still so simple that I still believed in fairy tales. <laughs> I was crying when he took me to my room. But as usual, he had a piece of candy for me. He always brought me treats because he said that I was his favorite. And he would give it to me when you weren't looking because it was our secret. And Uncle Trevor said that I kept a secret better than any old grown-up person. He sat me on his lap, and he fed me the candy as if I was still a baby. And I didn't mind because it made me feel special, like 
on nights when it was storming and you would let me sleep with you because you know that I'm afraid of lightning and thunder. He was rocking me in his lap, even after I'd stopped crying. And he was telling me real quietly how smart I was and that I was growing into a pretty young lady. He asked me if I had a boyfriend and I shook my head because oof, I didn't like to talk about anything that had to do with boys. And that made him begin to tease me. He said, you said that, that I shouldn't be afraid to tell him because we already had secrets between us. He asked me if I would like for him to be my boyfriend. And he laughed real loud when I said that he was too old to be my boyfriend, but that made him start to tickle me. He was rocking me on his lap and I couldn't keep still between the bouncing and the tickling. I knew that I was going to fall. So I grabbed him around his neck. His face was right next to mine and I could feel him breathing in my ear like a donkey. He kept asking me questions that made me feel uncomfortable and I was laughing so as not to let him see my shame. Things like, I know you have a boyfriend and not telling me. Do you let your boyfriend kiss you? Do you let him touch you? Or do you let him look up your dress like this? See, I was laughing and squirming because he was still tickling me with one hand. But his other hand was inside my panties. He was breathing even louder and I was begging him to stop. And I was trying to close my legs so that he would remove his hand. He was whispering in my ear if I like the way it feel. He said that this was a grown up feeling for when you are old enough to have a boyfriend and that I was ready. I was scared. I was scared because I knew that God was watching and that he would be angry with me. I was so glad when he finally removed his hand. But then he unzipped his pant and took out his big old And then he held on to it real tight. He kept begging me to touch it, but I was frightened. It looked like it was moving all by itself. Suddenly, his face turned horrible with pain and he was moaning like, like a dog had moaned when the car backed over his foot. I was really scared because I didn't know what was happening. But then he wet on himself all nasty and white. He slowly opened his eyes and he smiled broad across his face. He said that I was truly smart and that he would teach me how to be a proper girlfriend but that it had to be our secret. I was a big girl for nine and everybody said I was growing fast that year. I knew I was growing because I was able to keep a grown up secret even from you, ma. <laughs> Can you keep a secret? Keep it in your mind. Don't laugh, don't talk, don't, oh ma. how I wish I could really talk to you. I don't want to have a baby, Ma. I really want to go to college. You promised I was going to go to college. 
when I'm ready to have a baby, I'm not going to raise her on parables and fairy tales. But as soon as she learns to speak, I'm going to force feed her large doses of reality. I'm going to have her screaming from the treetops. Don't put your fucking hands on my private parts. My name is Najla Saeed, um, and I'm going to read a piece that is actually uh, based on an interview I did with my mom a while ago. Um, let's see, in about 2001, some friends of mine who are also Arab American and myself started a theater company. Um, and we started writing a play about being Arab in America. Um, this was actually before 9-11, but we ended up doing the play after 9-11. And I've been spending a lot of time with my mom during the COVID nightmare that we're all going through. And we've been talking a lot and I just realized what an incredible um, woman she is. And I wanted to revisit this, this interview I did with her. And so I've put it together into a sort of a new piece. Um, and I'm going to begin now. <clears throat> I am Maryam. I come from Lebanon. I was born in Beirut and I have been living in this country for 50 years, mostly in New York. I grew up in West, well, what is now called West Beirut. When I was growing up, it was known as Ras Beirut. Um, we lived in a neighborhood that was mixed. Uh, and Christians, uh, Muslims, Druzes, Jews, all lived in that area. Everybody was friendly. Uh, we were Protestants. Uh, more specifically, my father's family was a Quaker family. The first time I came to America was in 1963. I came with the experiment in international living. <laughs> I lived with a family in Hershey, Pennsylvania, which is famous, as you know, for the chocolate factory. I thought I knew what America would be like because I grew up in a Beirut that was very open and international, and I had known a lot of Americans there. But when I got here, I, I was quite um, surprised because the families I lived with were uh, much more, uh, how shall I put it? Uh, they had very little contact with the outside world and I felt superior in many ways. And I knew much more about the world. They, they had a very uh, limited idea of what people were. And uh, especially the Arabs, they had ideas about us that were, uh, you know, they asked me whether I wear the, um, what was my national dress and whether I was wearing Western clothes because I came to America. Uh, they asked me about camels. And I said to them, I only really saw camels occasionally, like in the Bakka Valley, which is a plateau in Eastern Lebanon. They, they were surprised. They thought everybody went to work on a camel. <laughs> the second time I came to America was in 1967. I came to New York to do a real estate course. That year was was very strange because uh, of the 1967 Arab-Israeli war. Actually, before the war happened and, and before the closing of the Strait of Tehran, the, um, the Independence Day of Israel uh, happened and just before the crisis took place. And for me, the biggest shock was to walk down Fifth Avenue and see that all of Fifth Avenue from 59th Street all the way down to the village was lined with Israeli flags. That was hard and, and it was hurtful in a way to hear everyone saying, we won, we won. You know, I want to tell you this story because this is a good story. When I first came to, to this country, uh, the first time I came in 63, nobody knew what yogurt is. 
Well, you see, yogurt in the Arab world is part of our everyday food and part of our life. We drink it and we call it Iran and, and we add it to the rice and we add it to this dish or that dish and we drip it and we eat it as, uh, for breakfast as labne every day. So for me, yogurt ha is associated with being sour and this wonderful uh, white milk um, that is sour in taste. When I came back here in 67, it was the beginning of the craze of yogurt in this country. And yogurt was um, flavored, flavored with, oh, sorry, flavored with raspberries and strawberries and blueberries. And I could not eat that stuff. And I found it very strange. And, you know, uh, you know, the only time yogurt was sweet for us, that they would tell, uh, they would put honey or sugar for us to eat when we were kids because it was very sour. But then as the years progressed here, uh, frozen yogurt came into existence and all of a sudden uh, yogurt became part of food in America. But for my children, they associated yogurt with sweets with the fruits, the frozen yogurt that was sweet, and, and with the desserts. And, and for me, this was very strange, because in my culture, I associated yogurt with sourness, with garlic and coriander and um, uh, with mint, dried mint, stuff like that. So I moved here for good in 1970 when I was married. You know, even before the civil war started in Lebanon in the mid 1970s, uh, people wanted to know what was my religion. And this used to annoy me. And I would become very stubborn and not want to tell them what my religion was. And I used to say, if I were from any other country, would you ask what my religion is? And this became worse during the civil war because, because you know, that was the most uh, tiring and stressful time in my life because my family and my husband's family were in Beirut and they were under fire. And, and when it first started, we, we didn't know what to expect. And, and then it accelerated in ways we never dreamed. And oh, there were times when we, we had lost contact with our families. We, didn't, we, we never knew if we would see them again or not. And the media here, they were uh, you know, not fair you know, how they always are here. Some people were sympathetic and asked many questions and wanted to know more. Uh, some people became antagonistic and said, you know, we are primitive people who are killing each other. That used to hurt my feelings. You know, to me, the word Arab, at first it makes me think of all the people in my own region, which is known as the Mashrit region the Lebanese, the Syrians, the Palestinians, the Iraqis, the Egyptians, um, and then the Khalijis, which means the Saudi Arabians, Kuwaitis, Yemenis, etc., and the North Africans. The North Africans are known as the Maghraba. And I, you know, I think of hospitality and friendliness, um, sometimes obnoxiousness. <laughs> We tend to be, I don't know uh, how to describe it, we tend to be rather crude sometimes. <laughs> uh, we ask direct questions, you know, the kind that you don't like. But yes, you know, I think of love and kindness and hospitality and community and family. That is what Arab culture is. Thank you, Najla. Wonderful monologue. Um, I'm going to read um, a monologue um, of a character called Flora Wisdom, a fortune teller. 
it's a version of it. I wrote it um, commissioned by the Nomad Theatrical and it was performed in parks in New York City, actually even last weekend, by a wonderful actress called Jamie Payton. Um, but this time I'm going to read it myself because uh, here for Liberty's Daughters, we want to hear the, the monologues in the playwrights, in the author's voice. So, Flora Wisdom, a fortune teller. She has a deck of tarot cards and um, she drinks from a tra travel coffee mug. She starts a Zoom meeting on an iPhone, giving a tarot reading to a woman. Hi, good to see your lovely face. I got your email, I know what bothers you. Don't you worry, ladybug. Flora Wisdom is here to tell you what's what. Flora Wisdom, the world famous fortune teller. You don't need to say anything. Close your eyes, imagine the most beautiful park. You have a lake in front of you, a calm, peaceful lake. Listen to the birds, smell the fresh air, hug a tree. Touch the barky wrinkles. It feels good, so good. You are in the right place at the right time. Dig into your soul now. Think about your main problem, honeybee. Focus on your dilemma. Let your thoughts cling to it, like they are on a boat, a kayak. You put your question in the kayak and I give you a paddle. You have to paddle on the deep lake of self-reflection. The sun is there after the rain. Paddle, paddle, paddle on the rainbow. Your future is there inside your soul, waiting to be revealed. I'm no regular fortune teller. I'm a poet too and a psychic. I published a book in my old country, poetry book, Wings of Fortune. It won two awards. Don't say anything, paddle on the silver lake of self-knowledge. I'm shuffling the cards now. I'm cleansing their shadows. I'm filling your soul. Okay, Bumblebee, let me take a sip of whisk of coffee. We'll do the small Celtic cross. We'll get concrete, specific. Tarot is not poetry, it's science. What do we have here? In the self position, aha, uh -huh. it's 10 of coins. You are moving among the privileged. You've got money, brains, friends who love you. This is a great card to start with, very auspicious. It shouts wealth, success. Okay, you're a writer. Three books published already. I goggled you, Hummingbird. You got the Wikipedia page. You're born here, your parents were born here. Lawyers, that's a good job. You are like what, early 30s? More books to write, more success to come. Yes, yes, you are here because your foolish husband cheated on you with a Barbie gold digger. Listen to Flora Wisdom, you don't need him. You are better on, off, on your own, Queen B. You could divorce him and get his money, but let's see. In the situation position, the chariot. You are speeding towards victory. Luck is knocking at your door. You can have it all, honeybee, the big all-American dream. Although this whole thing with the American dream, you can be a millionaire if you work hard, blah, blah, blah. Bullshit, pardon my French. I've been working hard for 20 years in this country, 20 years. I clean houses, I babysit, I worked in retail. I danced on a few bar counters. I sold my eggs years ago when I was a rosebud. What else? Oh yeah, this tarot gig. I did it first for fun at the party. Then some people recommended me to others. She's a gypsy fortune teller. Well, whatever. People love to put you in little exotic boxes. I'm not exotic, I'm <laughs> exhausted. <laughs> I'm no Mary Poppins. I can't make my bills disappear. Listen, butterfly, I can see you frowning. You are lucky to get this bargain. A first tarot reading, half price with the one and only Flora Wisdom, a rare intuitive empath. That's what the client said. How many readings do you, do you think I can do per day? I can't do more than 10 on a good day. I'm dog tired after 10. Do you know how hard it is to pick into someone's soul? 
I get all your worries and problems on me like breadcrumbs, crumbs from someone else's life. I age in a month like others in a year. How old do you think I am? Don't answer. Count my wrinkles. You think I'm in my 50s or 60s or God forbid 70s? <laughs> Wrong. I'm 39. Okay, okay. You better focus on your dilemma. Come on, paddle, paddle, paddle. I'm feeling your doubts, your panic. And here's the wrinkle you just added to my forehead. How much do you think wrinkles cost? That's the real question. And I'm not talking Botox. I gave 10 readings today. You are my 11th. That's when I start to lose my cool. But back to the cards, a professional is a professional. Challenges, the challenges position, the empress, great personality and luck. Oh, you are afraid of your own good fortune. That's stupid. Why are you really here, dragonfly? You know what? Hmm. The cards have spoken. You gotta give them a little tribute now. Eight dollars, bargain. PayPal, Venmo, Zelle, how do you wanna play? I did much more than a regular fortune teller. I'm a psychic, an intuitive empath, and a published poet. Did you see how much the psychics charge? The first minute is free, but then, wait a minute. What? That's why you are here? To study me? I'm your research? You're gonna write me as a stupid character in your fucking novel? No, 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 no. I could feel you are using me. Nope. I'm, I, 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 I don't, I, I don't want to be a character in your book. I want to be a character in my book. You know what? Your free reading is over. Get lost. Get out of my screen. Paddle in hell on a huge Barbie doll pussy with dollar bills stuck in your mouth. Damn. Now who's paying for my whiskey? Ugh, the cards, the cards, the cards, the sun. You are in the right place at the right time, doing your best work, my best work, my ass. How am I gonna play? How am I gonna pay the rent this month? How? I'm gonna end up sleeping on this fucking bench. Let's see. Let's see the full. You are on the edge of the chasm with no plan for the future. Yeah, right. Tell me something I don't know. Advice, advice, advice. Oh, the devil. You had to show up, didn't you? You can't leave me alone, you clingy, clingy asshole. Free tarot readings. I'm Flora Wisdom, the world famous fortune teller. I'm Flora Wisdom. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna be Flora homeless. Cory, your turn. Hello, everybody. My name is Cory Thomas, and I am Zooming from the land of the Lenape. Uh, my, I am a first-generation American. My mother was Brazilian, and my father was from Liberia, West Africa. My monologue is from a play called Citizen's Market, and everyone in the play is an immigrant. Uh, it takes place in a supermarket on the Upper West Side. And uh, this monologue is from a scene between a young lady named Akosua, who has just come from uh, Ghana. She got a uh, green card in a lottery. And she's in the lunchroom speaking to another woman from Sierra Leone named Siata. So Akosua speaking. There was a man in my village named Abeku. And we were friendly in school, and I could see his eyes following me, and things progressed. My family and I thought he and his father would knock on my door, but they went to my cousin instead. And he did not say a word to me about it. When he passed me in town, he looked down at the ground, and I could see that he was not following his true, true feeling. You wait, and you sleep and you wake, and you wait, and you sleep, and you wake, and you wait, and nothing, and nothing, and nothing, and nothing. And so one day, 
I'm ashamed to tell you, after all, you have gone through something so serious. This is silly. One day, I went to his compound, and I stood outside of his house, and I shouted his name. I shouted and shouted, Abeku, Abeku, come out. Abeku, come out and be honest. But my cousin, Tamwa, came out instead, and she said, Eh, hey, Akosua. Why are you shouting outside in our compound? And I said, dear cousin, I am sorry, but Abeku and I must confess to you our love. She said, what? And I said, I am actually the one who is supposed to be living inside of this house with him. Your husband has made love to me many times. She said, what? and her eyes were nearly falling out of her face. And so I said, I am sorry, but it is true. And he has told me that he loves me. And then she told me I am a prostitute homebreaker and she called the security people to come and throw me out to the street. And I screamed, Abeku, come out and tell these people the truth. But he did not come out. And the security people dragged me to the compound gate and Tamwa followed and kicked me here on my side. And my father and the chief and the elders of the village were very cross, and they sent me away. I used to be very confident. I do not think I can forget standing there and shouting and nothing and nothing and nothing. I shamed myself and I spoiled my family's name. Perhaps he will be unhappy. Perhaps he will suffer. Uh, good evening. Thank you for staying the course. My name is Jamara Wakefield, and I am uh, uh, sharing tonight uh, from the Muncie Lenape land. Um, and the piece I'm going to read is uh, from a larger piece that explores the intersection of uh, Winnie Mandela's life when she was in exile and Audre Lorde's um, life right before she moved to Berlin. And nobody wants to die on the way, caught between the ghosts of whiteness and the real water. None of us wanted to leave our bones on the way to salvation, three planets to the left and a century of light years ago. See, our spices are separate and particular, but our skin sign and complementary keys at a quarter to eight means time, we were telling the same stories over and over and over. Broken down gods survive in the crevices and mud pots of every belligerent city where it is obvious that too many bodies, there were too many bodies to cart to the ovens or the gallows. And our uses have become more important than our silence. Our labor has become more important than our silence. And I keep going back to that line that Audre Lord wrote as she dedicated that poem to Winnie Mandela, who at the time was a freedom fighter in exile. None of us wanted to die on the way. The idea, the concept, the reality of dying. See, I think of death both figuratively and literally. We are all going to die in this room. That is unavoidable. And yet, I want you to ask yourself, what will you do with your time here before you die? And how will you disrupt the ghost of whiteness and move towards the real waters? See, I am a descendant of enslaved Africans and indigenous people from the Americas. And the capitalism that bought and sold me is the same capitalism that I now use to buy groceries, 
or apparel or technology. See, capitalism is alive and well. And my life is a constant reminder of the ghosts of whiteness that never wanted me to be free or here or alive beyond my labor. My student loan debt is a reminder of the ghosts of whiteness. My struggle with gatekeepers, sometimes called editors or publishers or admission or hiring committees, is a reminder of the ghosts of whiteness. When my apartment applications are rejected, and when people touch my hair or my body without permission, when people assume my sexuality or my pronouns, I am reminded of the ghosts of whiteness. This is the short list, and this is the list I am not afraid to share with you. See, I find that vulnerability is the most powerful spell to cast over the specter of whiteness that haunts me daily. Eurocentric intellectualism loves binaries, but vulnerability dismantles binaries. Tapping into the body, the things we know and cannot utter, the words we utter that reveal our most tender selves. Lord told us that I have come to believe over and over again that what is most important must be spoken, made verbal and shared, even at the risk of, it ha of having it bruised or misunderstood, that the speaking profits me beyond any other effect. And this is the vulnerability I tap into when I write. The real water, for me, is action-oriented, it's movements, centered around indigenous struggle, black liberation, freeing Palestine, global wage workers' rights, and degentrification. In the real waters, we not only find Audre Lorde's writing, but her practice of disrupting the silence in the real water, where nobody wants to die on the way, caught between the ghosts of whiteness. And I want you to take a moment to close your eyes or at least settle your hearts and imagine, realize what it feels like to stand between the ghosts of whiteness and the real water. And ask yourself, what will you do with the time that you have? And what will you do with your resources and your privilege? After all, there is an illness among us a germ that hangs in the air that we breathe. And to cure it, we must look more closely at whiteness as an institution and America as a location born from an inheritance of hatred that stemmed directly from Western Europe in the form of colonization and imperialism and manifest destiny. And all the ideas that drive consumerism and capitalism. In all the ways that I've been attacked and dismissed and treated with contempt in nonviolent ways in the doctor's office, or any time someone decided that I was the other, and therefore I didn't matter. And who do you consider to be the other? And which others are you afraid of? And what others are afraid of you? If you think you can escape this problem, you are already deep in it. You are already deep in something. See, like Funkadelic, I have tasted the maggots in the minds of these times, and I am not offended. I am not, I'm concerned about, but not offended by my own complicity, for I know that I must rise above my own Americanness, openly, vocally, woefully, the same way I must dive into my blackness emotionally, boastfully, globally. See, I believe in another world in this world, and I want to be in that. A world that for now I can only imagine when I listen to Sun Ra or read Octavia Butler or when I touch myself on Saturday night or braid my hair on Sunday morning and rub coconut oil on my skin and call myself a queen to combat all the times I am called an other in the office or in the classroom, in the clinic, or at the train riding home. See, in spite of all that, I still believe in this world, and I plan to stay a believer like Curtis Mayfield, for I understand that even cage birds sing, and that human bodies know they are human, and that flowers blossom without permission, 
and this is how I believe we should live. But can we live? I want to live. Because I understand that even cage birds sing and that human bodies know they are human and that flowers blossom without permission. And this is how I believe we should live. Wow, thank you. Thank you so much, Jamara, for that amazing monologue. Thank you, everyone, for your powerful monologues. Please turn your video on, all the artists who presented uh, this evening. Um, uh, the people in the audience, please post the questions or comments in, um, in the chat. Now we'll have a short talk back to get some insights into the writers, the artist process, so please um, post your questions in the chat so we can access them. Um, while uh, uh, people in the audience post their uh, questions, I'm going to, to, start, um, to start our discussion. Um, can um, any of you tell us more about why did you choose this particular piece uh, now uh, to be presented before uh, the elections? anybody who would like to to talk i hope we hear from all of you i'll talk najla thank you um sorry um i was talking to some friends yesterday who are in dearborn michigan trying to um get out the vote for biden among the arab american community and i think um I think that the Arab American community, the Muslim American community does not realize how much power they have. Um, Michigan was lost last time by 10 or 20,000 votes. And within a community like Dearborn or Detroit, they actually have the power to help, um, you know, deliver Michigan to Biden. And so I wanted to remind everyone that we're part of this country and have been some of us have been here for a very long time and are american i'm third generation actually because my grandfather on my other side came first um and also to remind us that no matter how marginalized or othered we are we still have this privilege and power if we use it and so that's actually what led me to do this particular piece Thank you, Najla. Uh, who else wants to elaborate a little more on why they chose that piece? Mariana, thank you. Um, no, I mean, and I struggle with this. Um, I can't vote. Uh, the rules have changed and I'm not a citizen. And, and thank you, Trump, I cannot vote. And to me, it's super important that people do vote so in the future I can do too. Um, and that was kind of like the impulse of writing this thing. Thank you, Mariana. Uh, Vernice, thank you. Yeah, um, in this moment, as we're about to elect, um, well not elect, but put in place Amy Coney Barrett into the Supreme Court, and I'm um, thinking about uh, women and our access to our own bodies and making decisions about our own bodies um, and what her place on the court means for not so much me as the generation of children to come and the young people who need to have agency over their bodies um, I thought this monologue um, that was written, um, I think I wrote it like 20 plus years ago um, about this child having to make this choice that this was an appropriate piece for this moment. Yeah. Thank you, Bernice. Um, anybody else? Jessica. Yeah, uh, what a, what an incredible um, collection of pieces from an incredible collection of women. Um, I was commissioned to write this play and um, I, I'm going to brag a little bit. I'm going to brag about, about um, 
the most important work I've ever done, which was um, being a single mom and raising two women. And when I got this commission to write this play for this, the centennial of the 19th Amendment, I called my daughter and I said this, because you know I told her this, and I said, you know, because women got the vote 100 years ago, and she said, white women won. And I said, yeah, you're right, white women. And so I did this research, and the research was incredible about what happened in California in 1911. And, um, so I wrote it, and then, of course, the productions that were scheduled, because this was supposed to be a play that took place in the lunchroom that this woman actually had on Sutter Street in San Francisco, and the audience was going to get handed nickels, had already collecting nickels, and they were going to give their nickels for a bowl of soup, because that's how much soup cost in this woman's lunchroom, because she was advocating for the working class to get involved in suffrage. And um, the first theater, uh, even before the pandemic, said no because it was too political. And the, uh, the, they had already, you know, scheduled it. And then, and then the pandemic came. I got COVID. I got very sick. I, you know, everything closed down. So I really am trying very hard. I've done two versions of it. One is the solo piece that was was commissioned as a solo piece, and the other is a piece with um, one of our audience members is in, and, and is with eleven women that um, have read it together. And I'm putting both of these out there and trying to get people to really hear this this message before before November third, just to know what a what a great. Um, what a great lot of work it took from African American women and all kinds of, of different diverse populations of women to get the vote. And now finally we've got it. I mean, African American women didn't get the vote in 1920, they got the vote in 1965 through the Voting Rights Act. And so there's so much that we need to know about and so much we need to do uh, to exercise this right to vote. So I wanted to get this out there tonight. Yes, such a such a timely piece. Thank you for for sharing that. Um, yes, um, the, uh, the other writers. Um, oh, Tiasha. Yes. Tiasha. Um, hey. Yeah, I felt like this moment in history was like such a burning point, and for me personally, I felt like maybe never was I um, able or just like dare to really look. Uh, all the demons in the eyes and sort of be like, well, that's a problem and this is a problem and that's a problem. And um, I think that it starts here with the acknowledgement and then I think that that pressures us, that inner struggle pressures us into acting and doing things um, to, to make things better for ourselves and generations to come and, you know, to, to change the system, uh, regardless of how idealistic that sounds, but I think it is possible. Um, and, you know, I've done political uh, feminist work before, but none of it seemed to really um, carry maybe the message that I wanted to express today. And I thought this was like such a fantastic opportunity to, to target themes that I want to talk about of society, capitalism, exploitation. Um, I didn't talk so much about sustainability, but you know, like slavery, human slavery. Uh, I think that's that's really happening, and I think that this is something that sooner or later, with one government or the other, we'll have to look in the eye and address. Because I think we're killing our planet, we're killing ourselves. The systems are not serving anybody but the few people in power generating money. Um, so yeah, and what a perfect time uh, to, to address this right before the election. Yes, I'm, I'm so happy that we gathered and we, we united our voices and, you know, such different voices, but powerful voices. Jamara, would you comment a little bit? Your poem, a monologue, was so powerful. It really stayed with me. Uh, why did you choose this particular poem at this time? Yeah, uh, so I mean, I've been exploring um, ideas of like invisible forces in my work for, for a while. Um, and I wrote this before the pandemic, um, but I've been exploring, you know, things that hang in the air, you know, and, and kind of 
in all forms, so whether it's illness or music or oppression, but the things we can't see, but we know are there. Um, so that felt important. And then, you know, I always think it's a relevant question of what are we going to do with our time while we're here? You know, I, I think that's, everyone can ask that of themselves. Like, what can I do with my time? What can I do with my resources? And it's certainly one I ask of myself often. So, you know, that felt important, especially because we're all going to make decisions about voting and et cetera. But yeah. Thank you. And I think uh, Alice uh, or Rosa could, could share their thoughts now. Uh, Alice? Hi, I think I just came on. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, hi. Um, well, obviously my monologue had nothing to do with the election. <laughs> um, it was strictly about um, being the daughter of an immigrant woman. Um, and, and so I don't know if I can answer that question because um, it, I didn't choose it because of this time. I chose it because um, it, it was a piece of, it was one monologue from a, a bigger group of monologues. And um, ironically, I, my, the entire play is, is most of the characters have um, positive experiences with their choice to come here. Um, even if they have had negative experiences once they got here, the overall decision to come, they felt was the right decision. And I decided to choose this, the one character in the entire play whose decision was basic, first of all, not her decision, but also she didn't really, like, she didn't really feel that it was the right choice for her. She didn't really enjoy the, the, the change and the new life like most of the people around her and the other characters in the play did. Um, and I realized just hearing that one monologue, it sounded very anti-American, which I'm totally not. Um, <laughs> I think there's a lot of things we need to correct, but, um, but um, you know, it, I just wanted to kind of give the voice to when we meet that character, she is at her absolute um, breaking point, um, mentally like coming unhinged. So I just wanted to kind of like show that side instead of just like the, you know, I came here, I made a great life for my kids and myself or whatever, um, but to show that side of the, the loneliness and the despair that people feel when they leave their, their country and they leave everything behind, you know? Yeah, I think we are on the same wavelength with that because I didn't choose a monologue that was yeah. about the elections as well. I chose um, an immigrant woman who's just trying to survive, who yeah. might be homeless because she can't pay the rent, who, you know, maybe she was a, a writer in her old country, but here she has to be a fortune teller. And yeah, and other people might use her for, for research and write their own books, um, uh, you know, making a character out of her. So I just wanted to give her a voice, this fortune teller and uh, tarot cards reader. Yeah, because, you know, I do give tarot reading sometimes and uh, yeah, it happened uh, to me as well to sometimes other people to, to make a character out of me as opposed to uh, myself making a character out of this person that um, I, I like to, to create and explore and I think I understand her. So yeah, I decided that I need to write a monologue of Flora Wisdom, the fortune teller. Um, yeah, Al Alice, um, uh, you told us a little bit about the context, but can you elaborate more? Uh, sure, yes. Um, I'm actually just starting a new solo play um, set in the present in my building, the Belclair Hotel, during this, um, this time when it is a temporary homeless shelter. I, there are only 15 long-term tenants living in the building, and I now have 300 new neighbors who are clients of the Department of Homeless Services. And it's been such a really scary crisis in the Upper West Side with uh, rich, I don't know, at least 15,000, there's a group of 15,000 rich, powerful Upper West Siders who just want to get rid of these people, move them anywhere else but here, um, making claims that are completely, complete lies about increased crime. Actually, crime rate is lower now than it was in the Upper West Side a year ago at this time. Um, so I... My new piece is not ready to read from, but I wanted to uh, think about these bookends. I uh, Taking my earlier play, Thin Walls, uh, which is also set in the Belclair Hotel in the 1980s. Um, also, uh, it was when I moved in, uh, 
designated as housing for low income um, people. And a lot of that low income housing has been eroded over the decades. There's a much, much smaller stock of affordable housing and housing that is uh, rent stabilized for low income individuals. So this um, influx of a thousand um, homeless individuals into this neighborhood in three hotels um, has really, it has first caused a lot of enmity and hostility from a certain portion of our neighbors, but it has also inspired social activism. And this wonderful group, um, Upper West Side Open Hearts Initiative, uh, was a smaller group. They were less well-funded. It wasn't, you know, the, the, the rich and powerful, but this group has made an incredible difference. So, um, uh, the, the mayor had agreed, he had been, he had capitulated to his rich constituents and said, okay, okay, we'll get rid of these poor people who you don't want to have in your backyard. No problem. We'll move them to other hotels. And the, the social justice activists said, no, that is not okay. And we have made change. And they're at this point, it, the battle isn't over but these individuals are not, as of Saturday, the, the, um, the forced move, there were, there were school buses lined up outside the Lucerne Hotel on Saturday that the residents were supposed to get into to be moved to another hotel, but a judge said, nope, we're putting a stay on this, and so uh, they're not, they don't have to move. So anyway, it seems very relevant to the election because, um, you know, most of our new neighbors are black and brown individuals and they are, they don't have a lot of money and they don't have political clout. Although we have been running um, uh, voter registration campaigns for the new residents. In fact, I didn't realize, but homeless individuals have the right to vote. And so a lot of them have registered to vote and will be voting. Um, anyway. I, I thought that just thinking about the, the possibility of change if we speak up rather than just being silent in the face of injustice is so important and simply voting is one way that we can all speak up. Yes, thank you, Alice. Indeed, that's so important. And um, yeah, uh, my goal as well is to to make people and together we make we can make people understand that this multi-rooted belonging, these multiple identities, are to to be cherished, not to be othered. People need to understand that what we bring uh, uh, to this uh, country is um, uh, important. And I'm sure that people who are here already understand that, but uh, it needs to be uh, said. Uh, so uh, I don't see any uh, questions for us in the chat, but uh, I think we could um, ask some questions. If any of you has a question for the other artists, please, um, now is the time to ask a few short questions. Anybody who has a question for, for the other artists? This isn't a question. I just want to thank everybody here. Your, your readings were so moving and so beautiful. Thank you, everyone. Yay. Yes. Then, you know, it's wonderful to see your faces. It was amazing to hear your words. I'm still shaken and I'm still letting them inside me, inside my soul. Um, and it was so powerful, such a powerful evening. I'm so, yeah. I'm so glad that we, we got to share our stories and to, uh, to share this honest, powerful, inspiring and rich uh, uh, monologues and characters. I see, I hear an echo, but that's fine, you know? <laughs> it's the Statue of Liberty echoing <laughs> our words. <laughs> All right, now, then um, maybe um, please uh, turn um, your mics on, everyone, and let's um, try to tell people uh, to go to vote. Please, please, everyone who still listens to us, uh, don't forget to go and vote. Yes, thank you. This is Rosa. Thank you for staying with us this long. And these are very scary times and very, it is, I, I cannot stress how important it is that if you have the ability to vote, you should. 
like Mariana said, so many people do not. If you've been incarcerated, you don't have the right to vote. And it's taken for so many of us that those of us who have it, you have to get out there and vote. Likewise, you have to vote. I, I stood online for three and a half hours today to vote. I went into the voting area wearing literally three masks. <laughs> um, it was, I can't say it was fun waiting for three and a half hours, but I was inspired that there were there was a line that was eight blocks long of people there on the second day of voting who were just so committed to voting that as tired as my legs got, I was inspired and happy to be with, with my fellow New Yorkers and voting. So vote. <laughs> exactly. Vote, you people. I cannot vote, but if you do, eventually I might. Um, so please, please, please do. Um, thank you. Vote. Vote. <laughs> there are so many people who are going to struggle with voting. So and it amazes me that women used to not be able to vote in this country. So uh, a lot of people are going to have a hard time voting, even those that have the rights to vote. So vote with your voice and vote strong and vote twice. <laughs> no, don't do that. I'll let me <laughs> hear you say that. Vote. Yes, um, the privilege of voting, the opportunity to vote, and the fact that we're voting not necessarily for ourselves, but for the future. It's um, maybe what happened in Bolivia can be repeated here. And so it's really important that in this moment, we all rise up and vote. Yes, I just want to, I mean, I already said that thing about having the power, but also to all of my very, very lefty friends who sometimes think it's not worth it to vote for either bad candidate. Um, please vote, please vote, because it's a big difference. There's a big difference between moving in the right direction and staying where we are, possibly moving further in a not so great direction. Um, even if you don't love the candidate, please vote. Yeah, I agree. Um, I do a lot of work with incarcerated people and I know how um, treasured that ability to vote is when they are able to vote. Um, it, so I just um, urge everyone here to vote whether or not you like the candidates, please vote for one of them and hopefully the right one. <laughs> um, anyway, thank you all so much. It was a wonderful, wonderful evening. Vote. <laughs> just vote. 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 <laughs> just do it. Um, support your seniors, your first time voters. Um, hold space for people um, who speak other languages and, and may find it complicated or difficult to navigate the whole process. They make it that way on purpose. So just support other people um, after you cast your vote. vote. Thank you, everyone. And I am not a US citizen, so I cannot vote. So please, please vote for me. Vote, vote for, for all of us who can't vote. <laughs> and, um, vote for Sariana, vote for me. Yeah. <laughs> me too. And um, uh, now, everyone, thank you so much. If you want to turn your videos on, everyone, the audience as well, applauses. Applauses for our artists, applauses for our audience. And thanks, many thanks for everyone who is listening to us or will listen to us and uh, watch our monologues. Thank you all. Um, yeah, God bless you. <laughs> and uh, let's, uh, you know, be in a way joyful that we are able to still do an interesting and powerful artistic event like uh, this one. Um, art, poetry, theater still unites people. Bye everyone. Thank you everybody. So great to you everybody.